Now we can get into the um, uh, dedication of the mural. And um, we've got a very nice program planned tonight. We'll, we're going to ask first um, if we could get some recognition of the people who, who are in the mural. Then we're going to have a few words from our wonderful artist, Dennis Orlowski. And then Greg Kowalski uh, from the Historic Commission is going to be giving a, um, a, a little tour through the, um, through the mural. He often gives tours of the city. We'll have a few final words and then uh, we'll have the uh, Biasta Polish dancer do a uh, short performance and then we'll be serving um, dinner afterwards. Uh, so we hope that you can stay. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is, because I, I don't have everybody that was in the mural, their, their words, or, I mean their, uh, their, their names in front of me, uh, I'd like the people who are in the mural to stand. We have uh, a few people here in the mural. Do, no, we have those two people back there, okay. Just point where you're at. Okay, wait, one person at a time. Carol, go ahead, point where you're at. Okay, great. Dave? Right here? Okay. Go ahead. In the crowd? Oh, it's, oh yeah, oh great. Back there? Oh, Kelly, where are you? You're the nun. <laughs> Alexander? The, the French girl in the green dress. Okay, Chris? Right here, the, the brown boy? Okay, George? I'm the gentleman in the great park. Oh. Right, right there, okay. Anybody else that we're missing? I'm up here, so. <laughs> I would say I'll hear people's confessions. Let's give everybody a hand, okay? Thank you. You know, um, so many people participated in this mural, but it was really the idea from the very beginning of our wonderful community artist, Dennis Orlowski. I called him up and we had trouble getting together and we finally met here and I said, you know, can you can we buy a piece of eight by four plywood and you do something to put up there? And you know, he he looked at the room and he said, you know, I'm starting to get a, uh, about the same age that Michelangelo uh, painted the Sistine Chapel and he says, I gotta keep up with him. How about if I do the whole room? And I said, well. What would it be? And he came up with the idea of, of a history of the people of Amtrama. And it's a wonderful idea. And it took, it took quite a few years. It took about three years to raise the money just to get the, the, um, the panels up. But then um, we had a lot of supporters after that started to come forward. The first one was the, um, uh, the school system of Hamtramck. They um, uh, gave a grant from the schools of the 21st century, and they uh, paid Dennis, and Dennis worked with the kids and to paint the mural. So he drew the drawings, and, and the panels were down, and he um, uh, then had the, the, the drawings up, and the kids painted, and, and of course he helped them with that. Uh, later on, when the time was getting a little tight, um, he finished it up, but as the kids were here playing, he was um, uh, playing on the pool. He was talking to them as he was painting. So um, it's really been, a, again, a, a wonderful group from the community that come together. Besides the, um, uh, the school system, we had also support from the city of Detroit, which has state funds that they pass out to Hamtramck uh, from the Cultural Affairs Department. So we received a grant from them, and that actually paid for the panels. And then the Skillman Foundation, who's been very supportive of people's media services in many ways, uh, including the fine art program we have here for kids, they also provided funding. So um, again, um, why don't we give all those supporters a big hand for the With that, I'd like um, Dennis to 
to come up for a minute and to say a few words. And let's give him a standing ovation, okay? Say a few words. Uh, first of all, I'm a, I'm a Detroit public school teacher. I teach art at Denby High School, and uh, before that, I was teaching in Cooley. And uh, I, I brought my class here. Uh, we had, we're taking a bus trip to the, the Detroit Institute of Arts, and uh, we saw the exhibit that, that they have of the annual art show. And I always say, "Come on, we got time. Let's turn go into Hamtramck," and I would bring them in here uh, and show them. And it's part of what I teach. It involves drawing and looking and looking from life uh, at, at things and getting involved. Now, now I know Greg's going to talk about the history of the mural, and I'm going to talk about the artistic stuff. You know, now, right now everybody's an artist in the world, I guess, right? I mean, I did this, I'm an artist. I'm going to tear this up, and I'm an artist. Or there's different so many levels of art, and it's true. Everybody is creative and an artist. But when I was growing up, I you know I look at the you know books on Michelangelo and, and I could draw really well. You know, I could, it's like magic when you're a child. You know, I can draw this, and other kids go, "Wow, that's really something," and it is. But you know, in the age of taking photographs with a camera, bam, I can get that. I can do that faster than you can. It, you, and you see images, you're bombarded with images, and it's like it's not nothing. You know, and you feel like, well, gee, it's not that special, but it is. You know, uh, training yourself, you know. It's like the Jedi Knights, you know, and, and they could do it, there's powers, they don't need the mechanical things to do it. Um, but of course, and of course it's, 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 as growing up, uh, you know, you realize you, you really can't make a living. I, I, I saw that in a way. But I, I, I in the army, I would work uh, doing art on the side, and the commander would say, let this guy do this, you know, he, don't touch him. He will do this, and, and, and you realize how it must have been in the time of the kings, where you know special people could do special things, and you felt special, and you would uh, uh, do this magic in your art. And um, any chance I did for murals or public things, I always enjoyed doing it. And art nowadays, it's more uh, the artists would say when they show their work, "This is me, uh, me art. This is a Picasso." what he's saying, it's a Picasso first. And uh, I always like to channel things, history, and um, you know, like like a, what a churchman would do, we channel, speak, uh, you know, channel things out to the people, explain things. And the art is in it, I mean, my drawing is in this and everything, but it's dealing with the history of people. And the excitement of, you know, all these people, right? These are real people in these murals, Vincent and Jackie, and, Tom is the priest, and, and I would draw them, and then I would redraw them for the mural. And uh, so it's not using photographic means, but just myself, my vision, and them, and uh, doing this art, harmonizing the colors. And, and these are a lot of optical things up here. What the <laughs> I can't talk now. I'm, I'm on the podium giving a speech. I can't talk. I got, I'm giving a speech at this moment. Okay? I can't talk. <laughs> but these are all interesting optical effects. You know, with a camera, you can fade it out, fade it in. But I would use glazes and... Uh, different methods, and there's a lot of good stuff up here, and the narrative story of this, I, I would be affected by the people. Like, I'd be working here, and I would need somebody, and uh, I'd say, Tom, I need somebody, or Vincent, and they bring me some children. Okay, can you pose? Uh, let's take an example of uh, the boy eating the uh, uh, hot dog. I needed someone eating a hot dog, so I said, come here, come here, and uh, I took a piece of paper, rolled it up, I said, how would you eat this hot dog? You know, and then I would draw him and then uh, use his clothes and use a hot dog and then somehow get it in there. The girl that's in the sari, Bangladesh girl, her name is Nifa. She's supposed to be here. Uh, she's my neighbor 
where I live. And I saw her leaving to a party like that, and I said, could I draw you, and uh, I'm going to use you in the mural. And she posed in that uh, outfit, and I put her right there. And, uh, and well, there's many stories, the whole thing. I'm going to write a book. Uh, okay, well, that's, uh, it's getting a little, I'm going to cut this off right now, I keep talking. But thank you very much, and you know, it's a great honor. Like an artist has a show of his work, and people come, and then they take it down. And having your work up here for the public, you know, you're around and people sing it, and that's the greatest honor. And so I, I really feel, you know, I'm, it, yeah, I know I'm taken care of here, okay? Thank you. Um, the next uh, item we're going to have is a, is a tour of the mural. So we have uh, Greg Kowalski. Greg has been helping since the very conception of the idea in um, developing to make sure this is a historically accurate mural. And um, he was always very uh, giving of his time and giving of his time now to, uh, to do the, uh, the tour. So with that, I'll turn it over to Greg Kowalski. Thank you, Tom, and thank you, Dennis. Dennis is also a member of the Historical Commission, and I can't tell you how extremely proud we are of him and the beautiful work of art that he produced here. We are just absolutely blown away by it. It's wonderful. We're going to take a tour all the way around the, this room, but we're going to do it in a way so you don't have to turn your head and strain yourself. Uh, I'm going to be leading it with a little laser pointer. And Greg Kirshner is going to be following along with the camera. But since we need to start over there, we're going to lower the screen momentarily, and then we're going to go around. Did you need the lights down? If you could turn the lights down. Yeah. That would be good. I think you're getting a very surrealistic effect now. <laughs> This is the people of Hamtramck. <laughs> there we go. Okay, we're going to start where Hamtramck started. And when Dennis sat down to do this mural, we kind of figured, well, where did Hamtramck start? When did it start? And how did it start? And it really, um, we traced it back to the woods about 11,000 years ago. So we've got a pretty long journey ahead of us today, but it won't take that long to get through it. But we did start with the Ice Ages, way, way back in the about 10,000 BC, the glaciers, some of which were a mile thick, covered this area. And uh, as they retreated, they carved out the Great Lakes and formed the Michigan that we know today. And this area was gradually settled by the first Native Americans who moved into this area. And these were the Potawatomi, the Chippewa, the Wyandotte, the, Aho, the Huron, a whole variety of Native American tribes that settled here. And for basically, for thousands of years, they ran, they, you know, lived off the land and uh, led their own lives. It wasn't until we get into this period here in the around 1610 that the first missionaries first started coming through this area and they um, met with the Native Americans and from there that led through about a period of 91 years of missionaries passing through here and early settlers coming here and then, then about 1701 or in 1701 the city of Detroit was founded, actually Fort Detroit was founded and became the city of Detroit, which we know today and grew over the, uh, the decades that followed. Following the Revolutionary War, Detroit was actually supposed to be in the hands of the Americans. However, the British would not leave the area, which caused a lot of, uh, a lot of problems between the Americans and the British. And finally, in 1796, General George Washington sent Colonel Hamtramck, Colonel John Francis Hamtramck, to the Detroit area to finally take this land back for the Americans. And Colonel Hamtramck's troops accepted the surrender of Fort Detroit from the British in 1796. Two years later, 
The first Hamtramck Township was formed in 1798. Um, it was named after Colonel Hentramick, who was very well respected in this area, in this area, and quite well known to uh, so many people. The earlier settlers here were principally farmers, and they were principally German and French farmers, with the majority really being the German farmers. And you can see, in 1827, when Hentramick Township uh, was again reformed. Uh, it had a population of, of 1,063 people, 563 men, 493 women, and seven people of color, as it was referred to at that time. Um, very small population, large area, and you can see the names of the people today even reflected in the signs of the original settlers here. When we have the Brownback, the Nabel, the Convo, the Geimer, the Kona. Kona and Campo being French, and the others being of German origin. After that period, uh, this, the railroad started coming through. And then in this here, if you look at the annexation of the Hamtramck Township, you can see how Hamtramck, what we know of how it's Hamtramck today, gradually shrank through the years from the original borders of Hamtramck Township. Piece by piece, the city of Detroit grew north from the river taking one section after section after section after section and moving through all the way out to what was Eight Mile Road, what became Eight Mile Road, that originally was known as Baseline, and it extended all the way through to the Gross Points and encompassed the Gross Points, so our friends in Gross Point are indeed Hamtramickens. And Woodward Avenue was here, Highland Park being right there. Um, most of Detroit expanded up to this area by the 20th century, leaving only a few sections that were still Hamtramck Township. And the township existed, coexisted with the village of Hamtramck, which was formed in 1901. I'm going to try and follow my little script a little bit. I don't do a good job of it because I'd much rather just wing it. But um, at this period, and we're talking about in the 1850s, as we move forward through it, Hamtramck was a little town, uh, still a township rather, but there was also a Jewish community centered in this area, which established Beth Olam Cemetery in Hamtramck. And a lot of Hamtramckans today don't realize that there is a cemetery in the city of Hamtramck, and it is a little Jewish cemetery that was founded in about 1850 and remained in operation until about 1949 when the last burial occurred. And that cemetery today is on the grounds of the Poltown plant, the GM Poltown plant. It's open twice a year, two days a year, and you can go and visit it on those two days. The rest of the year, it's closed. It's only about a half an acre in size, so it's very, very tiny, but it is very well maintained. In 1901, as you can see from this item here, uh, the village of Hamtramck was formed out of Hamtramck Township. So the village was about 2.2 square miles. So it was just a little bit bigger than what we can know today as the city of Hamtramck. And the village existed again concurrently with the township of Hamtramck, uh, which had its own board and its own directors and was separate from the village. And you can see again 1901, and this is a period when we're starting to get more immigrants moving into the town as well. Um, by 1910, though, everything started to change in Hamtramck because that was the year that John and Horace Dodge bought a piece of property in the south southeastern corner of the village and decided to build automobiles there. And that became the Dodge main plant. The Dodge brothers worked for Henry Ford. They were uh, extremely well respected as engineers and known across the country when the Dodge brothers announced that they were going to market their own, build and market their own car, they got something like 13,000 requests for dealerships. And this is in a period of about 1910. The first Dodges rolled off the line in 1914. And this really precipitated modern Hamtramck. This is the Hamtramck that we know came from the Dodge Brothers in 1910. Because in 1910, Hamtramck had a population of 3,500 people. In 1920, it had a population of nearly 48,000 people. We're still in this area here. Now, that was the fastest growing, most densely populated town in America. It's just extraordinary numbers. When you think of that kind of density of 48,000 people in an area of 2.1 square miles, it's quite remarkable. 
Um, of course, with that brought a lot of growth, and Joseph Campo started to grow. This is the intersection of Joseph Campo and Holbrook, as it appeared, <clears throat> in about 1922. And 1922 was a very significant port, uh, time because that was the year that Hamtramck formed as a city. And that was done primarily to prevent Detroit, with all due respects to our Detroit friends, that uh, they would, Detroit would not annex any more portions of Hamtramck, and Hamtramck would remain as an independent city all on its own. And if Hamtramckans embraced the concept of having a town of their own very, very well. And with that came the era of prohibition, and Hamtramck became kind of a wide open town, and you can see some symbols of that particular era right there. We've got the bathtub gin, and I mean, they literally made bathtub gin in Hamtramck, in bathtubs, we have photos of it. We have, uh, I like to say that things were not always as they seemed because the bathroom in the house really was a still an illegal liquor operation, and that charming young lady right there with the fur coat was a raccoon coat, was, got a Coco Chanel gown under there, and um, the city itself was pretty wide open. It wasn't all wild, though. We did have anchors of morality and people fighting to keep Hamtramck as a good, clean, you know, fine place to live. And we see that reflected in St. Peter's AME Church, uh, which has been in operation in Hamtramck for many, many decades, going all the way back to the 1920s. But the lure of the prohibition, of prohibition money was really, really great at that time. And so in producing this mural, we decided that we were going to be straightforward and honest and accurate with the whole presentation. So showing the good and the bad, and so we had a number of mayors who were arrested for corruption and who went to prison for, it's, it happened, and so we're, gonna, we're going to accept that. And particularly we're seeing Mayor Tenerovich here, who is a very flamboyant character, and who not only was sent to prison for jail for corruption, but a petition was signed by thousands of people and he was pardoned by the governor and he was promptly elected to Congress after he got out of jail. <laughs> so, how Hamtramckans are a very forgiving sort of people. Oh, that, I'm sorry, that reflects there, reflects the great fire of Detroit that burned in 1805 and rose from the ashes. And, um, that was next to Hamtramck, Detroit, Hamtramck Township completely surrounded Detroit at that time, or, or almost completely, I should say, on this side, uh, it was not, it was another township. But that reflects the Great Fire of 1805. Every, just about every significant event in Hamtramck's history and related history with Detroit is represented on here. Um, in 1937, we had Mary Zuck who was, became an important labor leader because she led the meat strike, which was started by Hamtramck women, who were protesting the high cost of uh, meat at that point, and they couldn't feed their families. That strike eventually spread to Chicago and went all the way to Washington, D.C., where Mrs. Zuck met with President Roosevelt's cabinet to discuss that. Um, this was, these were desperate times though. This is where Hamtramck was in the depths of the Depression. And Hamtramck was a laborer city, a blue collar, blue collar city. Most of the people worked in the auto plants. So the city was really hard hit by the Depression. And their, the unemployment rate was well over 50% during these, year, these years. And in that time, Hamtramck actually had to issue its own money, which is called Scrip, which was redeemed later. And, uh, there are still examples of this money in existence. We have a whole collection of it with the Historical Commission now, but in a number of communities issued this kind of money during the Depression. But it was, it was a very, very tough time. I have to catch up with my script. Um, the Labor movements was also uh, a strong force at this time, as we saw we saw a bit of this with the, uh, the meat strike, but really it was the Dodge Main strike in 1937, and that was part of the Chrysler sit-down strike that affected the whole metro area that was extremely important in helping establish the, our gift strength to the labor movement, particularly helping establish the United Auto Workers. The Dodge Main strike was very important in uh, part of that strike, and uh, it lasted about three weeks. 
And amazingly, it was a peaceful strike. No violence of any real magnitude was reported. So that's really now, uh, was a real accomplishment for this city at that time. So we've got the strikers out there, and that helped to a great deal establish the uh, Hamtramck as a labor center. And Hamtramck at this concurrently also was a great democratic powerhouse politically. Because by 1930, Hamtramck had a population of about 56,000 people. Again, in this 2.1 square miles. And because so many of them were laborers, they identified greatly with the Democratic Party. And during the elections, they would turn out at a rate of about 80%. So that's an enormous voter turnout. And if you combine those factors of 56,000 people, 80% of the registered voters turn out to vote, and 99% of those vote Democratic, that was enough to attract attention all the way to Washington. And so we see, in 1936, President Roosevelt came to town. And he came to dedicate Keyword Stadium, which was built with WPA money. In addition to that, the Hamtramck Post Office was built with WPA money as well. And think about those two factors. We have two major civic projects being built in the city during the depths of the Depression. That's a pretty impressive accomplishment to get federal money freed up to do that. In 1939, which was right about here, you can get some of the ideas of Hamtramck's population, if you can see the numbers. But that was also a pivotal, a pivotal year for Hamtramck as well, because that was the year, of course, that Hitler invaded Poland to start World War, World War II. That had a devastating impact on Hamtramck as well, because so many people here had direct relatives living in Poland, and they would, uh, you know, they feared for their safety, they feared for their lives, and with good reason, because Hamp Poland was very well devastated by World War II. And, um, it was a tragic event for many Hamtramck's, and many Hamtramck's fought very bravely in World War II. Among them was current Lieutenant Raymond Zussman. Raymond Zussman won the Congressional Medal of Honor, which is a great source of pride for Hamtramck. He pretty much single-handedly liberated a town in France just after D-Day, and he did an incredible job uh, on his own, literally. And uh, unfortunately, he, he was awarded the Medal of Honor, but he received it posthumously because only about a week after his brave incident, he was killed in action. But Zussman Park, which is in front of City Hall, of course, is named in his honor, and he's a great source of pride for all Hamtramckens. Um, during the turmoil of the war years, we also had, though, the, you can see the churches that flourished in Hamtramck, and still do to this day. We have St. Florian and St. Um, Our Lady Queen of Apostles and St. Ladislaus and Immaculate Conception Ukrainian Catholic Church, which opened just as the war itself was beginning. These days, of course, we have many more places of worship, including mosques and um, the uh, Baptist churches and well, as well as and, and the Zen Center. And so Hatramic has always had a deep relationship with faith of religion or whatever religion the people held. And for those of us who went to Catholic school, this is a chilling sight. That is one of the mission nuns. And they literally taught us with sticks. They beat us with sticks. I went through 12 years of Catholic school, and it was an experience I'll never forget. It was a very valuable experience, but I still remember those yardsticks. During this period as well, Hamtramck uh, did a lot of things in terms of entertainment, uh, as did most cities, but Hamtramck had some special ties to the world of entertainment. Here, which I think Dennis depicted so beautifully, is a scene from the movie Lifeboat. Lifeboat starred the actor John Hodiak. John Hodiak was the 1932 graduate of uh, Hamtramck High School. John Hodiak was a major Hollywood star. He was one of the A-list stars. He started in major films. So Lifeboat was an Alfred Hitchcock movie and very, uh, very important in the history of Hollywood. Uh, that is Tom Tyler. Tom Tyler was the number one Western star in America in 1940. He was bigger than Roy Rogers. He died in St. Francis Hospital. 
He was from Hamtramck as well, originally from New York, but grew up in Hamtramck and worked at Dodge Main. He was discovered as a, well, he was a weightlifter. He was discovered while he was working at Dodge Main by a local talent agent who noticed his incredible physique. And we show movies of him at the library. And uh, I have to say, he's better looking than he is an actor. Well, let me try. And you can remember some of the I'm sure some of the great theaters that we had in town. There were seven movie theaters in Hamtramck. There was the Farnham, the Martha Washington, and I bet nobody remembers the Oliver Theater, which was on Oliver Street. And as well as a few others going all the way back to 1913, when the Jewel Theater was on Joseph Conklin at the South End. And hand in hand with that was night spots, particularly the Bowery nightclub. And the Bowery was one of the finest nightclubs in all of um, all of America, particularly the Midwest. All the great stars of that era, and that era being the 1940s going into the early 1950s, they all came to the Bowery. Sophie Tucker was there, the Three Stooges were there, Danny Thomas was there, Edward Everett Horton used to come there. I'm told that Frank Sinatra used to come there and watch the acts. He didn't perform there, but he had, would come down and see the acts that they performed. So it was a very, very major place. But that wasn't the only source of entertainment. In town, we had, going into the 1950s, there was a great interest in establishing a real library in Hamtramck. Hamtramck's library actually goes back to the early days of Tau Beta, back in about 1914, when it was originally established in the room of the Tau Beta Settlement House, with a handful of books that were donated by Tau Beta members. From that, it was moved to a small storefront on Joseph Campo, and then to the second story of a building on Joseph Campo, at a building which is still there, at Kenef and Joseph Campo, and then to one of the schools over at Play for School, and, uh, which was eventually demolished. So by the mid-1950s, though, the city was led to a great deal by the efforts of Mayor Albert Zapp to establish the Hamtramck Public Library and it's its own separate building. And I'm very pleased to say that the library, of course, is in fun functioning today. It was just there before I came here. And uh, it's still a great, great library. I know libraries all over the state. We'll Some of them... We'll celebrate 88th anniversary. 80th anniversary. Of, 80th anniversary. of November. There we are. I have worked with libraries all over the state, particularly Birmingham, Bloomfield Township, West Bloomfield, and that whole area. And although their libraries are wonderful and they're 10 times bigger than ours, ours is incredibly wonderful in its own way for the programs it provides and for being what a library should be. And that's a part of our community, a really active part of our community. We also notched a lot of great uh, accomplishments in the world of sports where we have June Hoxie who is a nationally known tennis a coach who coached a lot of great stars and of course we had the Little League Champions in 1959, the Pony League Champions in 1961, and a lot of other sports stars like Rudy Tomjanovich and Tom Pachorek and others, Walter Roxy, you can go on and on, who came from Hamtramck and really represented this city well. At this point, we're like going through the late 19th to the early 1960s and into the 1970s. This kind of encompasses how Hamtramck especially started changing in the 1970s as we began to get a new wave of immigrants moving into town. And these were immigrants from different lands uh, from that we were used to. They weren't all Polish immigrants. We started getting a large percentage of people from Yemen moving into town, and the Arab population in Hamtramck began to grow. Um, did you forget the Little League Mass World Champions? No, no, we were right there. Right there. The Little League and Pony League, right there. We could not forget them. <laughs> no, sir. But, um, of course, things began to change again in 1979 uh, when Dodge, when Chris the Corporation closed Dodge Main. And a lot of people at that time thought this would be the end of air traffic. It lost a lot of its revenue, it lost its biggest employer, it lost its landmark, and in a lot of ways it lost really what would have been the life's blood of Hamtramck because Dodge Main was the soul of Hamtramck for a long, long time. But um, within a year, General Motors came forward with a plan to build the Pole Town plant in the area of Stradling, Hamtramck, in Detroit. 
and through a wonderful agreement worked out between Hamtramck and the city of Detroit, it was that plan was clear and the area was made, the, the area was cleared so that the, the pole town plant could be constructed, which pumped an enormous amount of revenue back into the city of Hamtramck and really helped rebuild the city. But in that period too, we were in a, in a great state of turmoil, a lot of feelings that we were in a desperate situation, and we got some new political leaders arriving on the scene, Bob Kazarin came onto the political scene, and he, his idea was to invigorate the city by holding meetings and starting the first city festival, which continues to this day, and really to bring new life and new vitality into the city. Uh, and the San Jacinto Festival grew to enormous proportions, and to this day it still attracts many thousands of people into the city. There are a lot of people, though, who say that this was Hamtramck's finest day when Pope John Paul II came to visit the city of Hamtramck. Now, whether you recognize him as a world leader or a religious leader, in any state, it, you, you have to accept that he was just a, it was a wonderful day for Hamtramck to have a person of his stature come to the city. And he knew Hamtramck. He had been here prior to his visit. He had been here back in 1968 when he was an archbishop. And I was told that on his deathbed, Cardinal Maida visited him in Rome. And Cardinal Maida said, I'm Cardinal Maida from Hamtramck. And he said, oh yes, I know. And he said, how are the people of Hamtramck? He knew this town. He remembered us to the very end. And that's a source of pride for all of us. Um, but, you know, we're getting... Uh, things began to change again, you know, the more immigrant population moving in, and what's really interesting is that in 1990, Hamtramck had a population of 18,000 people. By the year 2000, we thought the census was going to show maybe 16,000, but what a surprise, it turned out to be 24,000 people. We had a 25% population growth between 1990 and 2000. That reversed a 60-year trend of declining population. From 1930 to 1990, every decade, Hamtramck's population went down significantly. But in the 1990s, it started to reverse. And I'm glad to say that that trend is continuing today. The latest SEMCOG figures that came out just a month ago, or just a few weeks ago, show that we are now up to 25,600 people. And we probably are going to hit 30,000 people by the 2010 census. We are getting back there in rankings among major cities in Michigan. It's a significant population. I frankly think that we're closer to 27,000 people, at least now. I don't think a lot of people are being counted in the census. So that's good. We don't want to get back to 56,000 people because nobody will be able to park their cars for sure. <laughs> it's bad enough as it is. But it is a good thing to see, but it's a sign of vitality that the city is growing again. Um, 1997 was another special year, if only because the tornado roared through here, and it did a considerable uh, amount of damage. Only one person was killed, which happened in the aftermath of the tornado. And um, I'd like to point out, too, that People's Community Service played a big role in dealing with the aftermath of that tornado. Um, the People's Community Service was officially designated by the city of Hamtramck to be the lead agency for relief effort. Eventually, over $40,000 passed through People's Community Services to the victims of the tornado. And PCS, of course, is very proud of the role that it has played in the history of Hamtramck. And that role goes back a number of years. Um, People's Community Service, and I've got to read this because honestly Tom supplied it to me. But PCS originally ran the Dodge Christian Community House on Mount Elliott across from Dodge, Maine. That center closed in the early 1960s, and PCS ran several small offices in Hampshire until 1968, when a few women, including Josephine Oakland, who I frankly I knew quite well, set up a small storefront, a teen drop-in center across from Veterans Park and what is now a Yemen's Cafe. Uh, People's Community Services agreed to run the drop-in center for the women. This was the seed for the president's facility we are in now. After moving several times, PCS renovated the old Warner Ambulance building and eventually built the gym. And I will tell you, um, this is a true gem of the city. This organization is one of the, source, the great sources of pride 
Abraham Pramik had accomplished so much truly. PCS has made its place in Hamtramck's history. It is there for us to, to really acknowledge. Um, but as we move forward, the aftermath of the tornado, in a way, brought a kind of a, a political winds of change as well. They were not entirely uh, beneficial or benevolent, I should say. There was a lot of political turmoil in the late 1990s. We had a new group of people coming in, getting involved in a political scene, which we saw Gary Zich as elected as mayor, who replaced Bob Pizarin, who had been mayor for 18 years, the longest serving mayor in Hamtramck. And those of you who were here at the time remember that we went through elections that were decided by a single or just two or three votes, recounts decided by two or three votes, a lot of tension because there was a new guard and an old guard and things got tangled up in personalities and we had a lot of political uh, political feuding and fussing but you know that's part of Hamtramck too because you can go back 80 years and you'll find the same kind of thing going on back then so I always tell people it's a sign of vitality you know you can put a positive spin on anything so that's a sign that people really care when they get that involved that it really matters so much to them and we had a lot of that going back into there. But it was clear. Well, what, we, what this led to, though, is that um, the state had to step in when the, when the mayor and the council could not agree on adopting a budget. Finally, the state had to step in and they sent the emergency financial manager, Mr. Lewis Schimmel, into town to oversee Hamtramck's finances. And um, he did just that. He made a number of changes in town. Some people will say he did a great job, some people will say he did a terrible job, but we are here today. And uh, Mr. Schimmel is gone. He left Hamtramck several months ago, and two weeks ago we were informed by the state of Michigan that we are being taken off the list of the cities in distress and being given our financial freedom. But even at this period, it was clear that Hampshire could not do business as usual. We needed to change. So a movement was started to uh, adopt a new city charter. And this would replace the original city charter, which was an absolute mess that was adopted in 1922, which was perfectly fine for 1922, but it was just a hodgepodge of amendments by this period here. It took a couple attempts, but the new charter was adopted and really set a new course for Hamtramck politically and uh, gave us a lot of stability. And one of the features of the new charter is that we got a city manager, a professional per person. Mr. Crawford is our first city manager who has also made history for us. So, <laughs> we welcome him. And we have Dave Coles, who was one of the leading efforts to get that thing passed. And boy, the Charter Commission worked mightily on the Charter and to get it back to the wonderful I personally feel that the Charter was one of the most significant documents that really was ever passed in the city of Hamtramck and really was an enormous step forward for this city in terms of our future and our future stability. As we look ahead, we can see we're back kind of the way where we started though because we're back with people and the people of Hamtramck are the future of Hamtramck. We're getting different people in town, new immigrant groups, but we take pride in the fact that everybody has a place here and we want everybody to have a place here in this city. And together, we will move forward and we are moving forward. And I have enormous pride in what we've accomplished and how much, how far we've come as a city. I think this city is better than it's ever been and I see it getting better every year. And Dennis, I think you encapsulated that whole picture. So, wonderful job, thank you. Real quick, uh, but before that, um, 
somebody lost some keys. They look like they have a key tab on it that says number 13. I was thinking that was from here, but they're not. Uh, so if anybody has them, they're, they're here. Um, I'd also um, like to introduce um, uh, Mrs. Alma Mason. Could you stand up? The, the, the center here is named after her late husband, uh, Bishop A. Sherman Mason. We really made it a priority about 20 years ago when we were going through all these problems to, to make sure that this center came about. I'd also like to introduce the Mayor Van Famic, uh, Karen Majewski. I don't really need to come up here to do it, I suppose. I just want to welcome you all, and I'm not going to keep you because I know everybody's smelling the food. Um, but we have had uh, uh, encapsulated the history of Hamtramck, but I just want to remind everybody that we are writing the history of Hamtramck every day, and it's up to us what kind of history a hundred years from now we're more than 30,000 years from now, right, um, people will be telling, of, telling about us. I think we have, we have a, 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 as Greg said, a great um, future ahead of us. There are all kinds of exciting things happening in the city. Your evidence of that excitement that you're all here tonight. And so let's move forward and write the next chapter. Thanks. Yeah.